Side Hustle Show 180. It's a listener success story. How I went from zero customers to a full-time business. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. What's up, what's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. Today's episode is a listener success story. You'll hear from Scott Tarsi, who took his side business from zero customers after spending 500 bucks on marketing. That was kind of a low point, all the way up to the full-time business it is today. Scott runs caddesignhelp.com. That's CAD, like computer-aided drafting, where he helps inventors and product developers create prototypes of their ideas for manufacturing. So stick around to hear how Scott landed his first customers, the new-to-me buy button platform he found to really accelerate his growth, plus his plans to scale up beyond just the freelance hustle. You can find a free PDF highlight reel with all of Scott's top tips from this conversation at sidehustlenation.com slash Scott, along with the uh, notes and links mentioned as well. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is sponsored by designcrowd.com. Designcrowd, as you know, helps side hustlers, startups, and entrepreneurs like you get the perfect custom graphic design for your business. I'm going to be back to share a little bit more about Design Crowd along with my top takeaways from the call after this chat with Scott. But you can get started today at designcrowd.com slash hustle and get up to $100 off your next design project. Ready? Let's do it. You know, I think my dream had always been to own my own business and to be my own boss, but I had never, I guess, you know, took the initiative. I never, you got to take action. You got to do something. It's just not going to happen. In February of 2014, I had actually put my site out there, did some AdWords, didn't get any results, and just kind of discouraged. I mean, I was trying to do that on the side. Okay, so you build the site. You said, hey, I can help you with your product design. And you ran, like, what kind of keywords were you targeting at that point? I, I never had any success with AdWords. I probably need to try it again. But, you know, CAD designer for hire, you know, invention help, 3D design, CAD modeling, all these things. And nothing. So you blew through your, your ad budget on that. So how much did you end up spending? Um, I probably spent 500 bucks or so. I mean, it it was enough to, to that it should have done me something. And I didn't, a valid sample size to say, oh, shoot, this isn't going to work. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so yeah, you know, then like a year later, a, a big game changer for me, I read this book called The $100 Startup, and it really just kind of broke down, like you were saying, like, what, do you have a skill that you can do? And then here's what you got to do to get started. And it just gave me a lot of good ideas. That and I also read before our work week, and I just said, you know what? I'm tired of working for somebody else. I'm going to really start pushing this. It would also help when I first started the side business. I was in a small town of 30,000 people. Well, a year later, I had moved for another for just you know my full time job, the sales job, to Charlotte, which is you know a million people here. So I found a group here called the Inventors Network. And so, as you can imagine, inventors need a CAD designer, and that's the skill that I knew I had. So I said, well, I'll go to one of these meetings and I'll see if I. How did you How did you come across that group? Um, I had actually found them even when I was in Newburn, but it was just too far away. It was a five hour drive each way, and I said, well, I can't make a five hour drive on a Thursday, and then make it back to work on Friday in time just for the maybe chance I get a client. Like, it just that's just crazy. Was this just on like meetup.com or something like that? No, no. I think I did a Google search because I was just curious like if there was such a group. I just felt like that was my target market. Yeah, yeah, inventors. Okay. Yeah, and then I, when I saw Charlotte, but I was in Newburn, I said, well, it's too far away. That's the closest group, you know, Newburn, small town. But when I ended up in Charlotte, and in fact, when I moved here, I didn't even remember that I found them. It was like when I listened, when I read that book, The $100 Startup, and then I started thinking about how I can meet some people that might be my client. Then I remembered that I had found that group. Yeah. So I then I, so that's so that's the first action I took was I said okay I'm going to go to this meeting. I kid you not, I go in there and there's a guy there who needs some mechanical parts designed. He had this invention where, if you can imagine taking pictures of a retail space, if you know to make sure the shampoo is where it needs to be. It's kind of like a almost like a shopping cart, but it's got a bunch of cameras on it. And he needed a designer to you know design all the components to hold the cameras, like a little case for it. Okay. You know, a kind of a little lever, not lever, but like hinge system to, to rotate the camera to get it at the right angle. So I was like, yeah, I can do that. And it's funny because I didn't even have the software at the time. I was like, oh, man, I had to go, I had to go online that night and find like a free program just for the time being. Because I, it, it didn't make sense to justify the, you know, the four grand expense. And, yeah, and all the licenses. Solid work. Like, yeah, I was just like, there's got to be a free one I can use. And I did that for a while until I realized that the free ones just don't really cut it when you got a lot of work. That's interesting. So, I mean, I could see you 
a great example of going where your target customers already are you're finding this group uh, so i think that i mean i could even see you like speaking at this group down the road if you're still in charlotte i did i did actually speak at the group in about the six months after i had started going there there was you know I talked to the president of the group and he said yeah you know this would be it was actually my idea to speak because i thought well if i can get up there in front of all these people i met i had met most of them like on the side but if i can really get up there and plus, there's always new people. If I, can yeah. get, if I can get up there. I can establish a lot of credibility and, and, and show people I know what I'm talking about. And it did, it did help me quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you do go into the meetup groups. So this guy decides to hire you. How much do you, how much do you charge him to, to create this like, shopping cart camera contraption? You know, I do an hourly rate, usually around 50 an hour. And so you know, I, I think maybe it was like 10 hours of work total. I mean, it wasn't overly complicated. In fact, he had it already designed from a previous guy partially. So it was kind of like I took over a project. So that wasn't really a big one. And that's kind of the way it went for a while with these events. 500 bucks on the side? That's, that's a decent win. Yeah, over a couple of months. It wasn't enough at yet to replace my full-time income. So, yeah, 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 it wasn't a lifestyle changer just yet. Uh, that wasn't, it wasn't quite yet. So what happens next? You find, uh, try any other marketing channels? Yeah, so at this time, you know, I, like I said, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm working a sales job. I've got now a client or two from the inventors group. And so I'm looking online, and I, you know, I find this website Elance, which I'm sure a lot of other freelancers have heard of. And so I, you know, I start, I make, I make a profile, and I start putting in proposals, and I just have no luck. I mean, I don't even get an email back most of the time. And just every day I'd go and apply, and just, and so it got very discouraging. So I really didn't get any luck there. But then I ended up stumbling upon this website called Thumbtack, and this was really kind of the game changer for me. Okay, this is called Thumbtack.com. Yeah, Thumbtack.com. Okay, so Elance, Elance didn't work or Upwork didn't work. I did end up doing three jobs there later on, and one of them was pretty big, but it's really hit or miss out there. I still apply to jobs on there when, when it's slow on Thumbtack, and it's very rare for me to get one. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Like If you go back in the Side Hustle Show archive, some people are like adamantly opposed to Upwork, and other people are like, no, it's great. You, here's, you just gotta, you know, here's how you make your proposal stand out. You do this, this, and this. Like, yeah, and it really I think it really depends on the market. With what I'm doing, because you can do it from anywhere, you don't have to really be local for a lot of it anyways, you know, and and I think people can go overseas and get lower prices. I mean, it's just that's just kind of the reality. So maybe in other industries that's not as likely to happen or something. But tell me about Thumbtack. That's a platform that I have only heard of uh, very very recently. What I really like about it is that only 5 people can quote and so think about it from the client standpoint. And it, it, it's interesting to me on Upwork when if I'm the client on Upwork and I put in a job for whatever, hundreds of people will apply. Like, are you going to really read through hundreds? How are you going to find the best one? I mean, you can probably filter by price, but if you want to know who's going to be the best, you're going to have to read through all this. It's just mind boggling. So Thumbtack really kind of simplified the whole process and said, okay, the first five people that respond get their quote in and then it's locked. And so you're, you're going to get a price range. You're going to be able to read five people's profile. That's not too hard to do. And then yeah. you can message them and kind of make your decision. So when I got on there, what I realized, is that you can imagine, is you got to be quick. You really got to keep your eye on it. When a request pops in, I mean, you can get notifications on your phone, and that's what I did. You got to really be quick to respond. So that's what I did. I would just respond real fast every time. Oh, okay. So you have it set up. So if somebody is, like, imagine posting in... Uh, you know, for an engineering job or like how specific do they <laughs> like to set up these filters? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they do everything. You can, if you're a house painter, you could, you can put on there, you can pick which categories you want. So as you can imagine, I do 3D modeling, I do CAD design, 3D printing, like all this kind of stuff. They, they even break it down to like, I turned off the architectural work because that's not really my expertise. I've done a couple of small things in it, but it's not really what I'm focused on. So like I turned that off. But originally, it was on, and so I was getting kind of requests for stuff I didn't really want to do. But, but yeah, I mean, even any type of freelance, you could be a copywriter, a graphic designer. In fact, I hired the guy who did my website off of Thumbtack because I had been using it so long as a person for hire on there. I said, well, I like this so much. It's a, it, I'm going to try it from the other side. And so I found my website guy who did a great job on my website okay. for me. Now, like on their homepage, it, it looks like it's like for local contractors. It's like they've got, you know, it says house painting. They've got like... Uh, pictures of yeah. tape measures and nails, and, and so it looks like very like hands-on local stuff. It seems like they market it that way, but it's really a lot more than that. But maybe that's what they're trying to stress. I mean, they have all that. And obviously, if you're a guy who's painting houses or building houses or anything in person, you can only do local. I mean, you're not going to yeah. go drive across the country to go paint someone's walls. But 
with what I'm doing, you can really be down from anywhere. So for location independent people too, you can set your settings to where you get notifications local and the whole country. And that's what I do. Oh, and, oh, okay. you know, most, uh, most people for what I'm doing are okay. Now there are some people who really prefer in person and that's fine. But I still do plenty of in person, you know, meetings with people here, but for the most part, what I do, it really can be done through a Skype call. How does the platform make money? They take a cut of the bid, like uh, like Upwork. No, and actually, I like this more too. So Upwork, yeah, I mean, if you do a job for a thousand dollars and Upwork takes ten percent, well, you just paid them a hundred dollars for that job. Mm-hmm. That's quite a bit. Thumbtack, you just pay seven dollars to be in contact with the person, more or less. You know, if you buy a bigger, what they call credits, you know, you pay about seven credits per job. At least for what I do, I have a friend who does website design. He said for because there's so much demand and so much supply on the website side, you have to pay 12 credits, so it's a little more expensive. But So 7 to $12 per bid you submit? Yeah, roughly. For me, it's more like 7 but for web development guys, it's closer to 12 Okay, interesting. So, uh, yeah, you got a bank on that proposal. So they're, they're, the, the platform is cashing in $35 every time they fill up that 5-bid limit per job. Basically, yeah. Okay. Whether or not anybody gets hired. Yeah, and they fill that up a lot. But I, I will back Thumbtack on the fact that if somebody puts in a bogus request, if they put in a bogus request, you can email them and they'll 95% of the time respond and say, okay, yeah, we get this. We'll refund you. Or if they simply don't even look at your quote within 48 hours, I believe, they'll automatically refund you. So that actually happens quite a bit. Okay. You know? So you really don't, I don't think you necessarily waste a lot of the credits. I mean, I don't feel like I have because... I only probably get hired maybe 20% of the time, but that's plenty enough. I mean, I cover the cost of the credits. In fact, I actually keep track every week. I update it, but I keep track of, okay, what's my ROI on these credit purchases? Mm-hmm. You know, so I keep track of, okay, here's my, what's my revenue coming in directly related from this site, only clients from that site, and how much have I spent on credits? Well, I've tracked this since I started. And as you can imagine, when I first started, it was like I was making $2 back on every dollar I invested. Well, now I'm up to like $10 per dollar. So that's why I almost quote every job that's related to me because in the long run, I'm going to be better off. I mean, yeah, you got to, you know, like they say, you got to spend money to make money, but my ROI has clearly shown at this point that it makes sense for me to bid on as many jobs as I think I'm a good fit for because, I mean, the return is right there. And obviously, the more clients you get, a lot of times they'll just come back to you directly. You know, I've had this guy I did furniture design for three or four times where, yeah, the first time I did it on Thumbtack, but, you know, he's happy with my work and I get it done quickly. So he's just, comes right back to me through just a normal email and says, hey, I've got this chair here I need drawn up. Go to it. So Exactly. Yeah, they're on, they're on this platform because they don't have a go-to guy or gal to get that done. Yep. Now, once they have you, you know, you don't have to pay that bidding fee each time. Yep. W- what kind of volume are you seeing through there? Like, is this a relatively new platform? They've been around like for a long time and I just never heard of them. What's going on? It's really kind of crazy how I can have weeks where I'll send in 10 quotes a day, you know, Monday through Friday. And, and a lot of times, Saturday and Sunday, too, because what, what I like to call them the weekend warriors is these inventors who work full-time jobs, but they want to start their own side hustle yes. selling a product. And so they're doing it on the weekend, so I always keep my phone handy because I know that these kind of people are working those full-time jobs. So I'll do a lot of times, I'll do conference calls or Skype calls with these people on the weekends because I know that's when they're off work. I know there are people listening to this right now who are like, oh, I could use some design help. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I mean, I, could, I would love to help them out, but... Yeah, so you know the volume. It really depends. I mean, the last two weeks before this week had actually been incredibly slow. I was like, just it just kind of blew my mind to be honest with you. How few requests came in, but it just comes in waves. I mean, like December was a very slow month, as you can imagine, with Christmas and everything. And then January picked up. March was a massive month for me. And this month, the first two weeks were slow, but then this week was one of those crazy weeks where, like, today I had I bid on like three or four new jobs. I got two of them. Nice. I've had some clients come back again. So that's what I'm learning about as a, as a freelancer. You kind of got to, it comes and it goes. And so you want to kind of try to get as many irons in the fire as you can so that it kind of evens out. But I've actually got three people working for me kind of as a contract basis because I've had weeks where I've had so much and I don't want to cause delays to any people. So I've got a trusted three or four guys that do really good work. Oh, wow. And I can just, I, and they understand the CAD design, they're engineers as well. So I can send them a quick email with the file and say, okay, you know, here's what I need. And then they can do it. And then, you know, so I I keep everything, excuse me, moving along. Have you stuck to that $50 an hour rate or has it gone up since since the beginning? I have stuck to it because what I realized on Thumbtack is that you are bidding against other people. And so I can't really go out there and throw $100 an hour because there's really not a lot of people doing that. And I think if I go that high, 
you know, I, I just don't think people are going to hire me, even though I've got a really good review. I've been hired 50 times and I've got five star rating and all these things. I think if you go too high, I think I have increased my prices a little bit. When, when I said 50 an hour at the start, that was more for the people I met in person. When I was doing Thumbtack, I was doing more like 30 because it was kind of more of an open bid situation. Gotcha, gotcha. So I think that's kind of where I am. I'd like to experiment more with higher ones, but I also, it depends on how busy I am. You know, if, if I'm very busy, maybe it's worth it. But if I don't have work, then it probably makes more sense for me not to do that as I'm risking. I think I've got a less chance to get the job. And the clients I try to go for, honestly, are the ones that aren't so concerned about the price, as you can imagine, more want a higher quality product. And that's the kind of market I really prefer to go after. Yeah, interesting. So any any best practices you can share on the bid process or the proposal process in terms of things beyond the price? Like what are you allowed to write in your profile or, or in, your, in that bid to, to entice people to pick you instead of the other four people? What I do is I have a a standard template in my uh, notepad on my phone. Because honestly, most of the time I'm out doing something or whatever, I'm not right at my computer. So I just copy and paste it into the response on the thing so I can get it in time. For, I mean, the first thing is you got to be in the top five to reserve your spot. Okay. Then, you know, I usually just do my standard thing because a lot of times the way Thumbtack sets up their questionnaire, they don't give, people don't give a lot of info. It might say, Sally S needs a CAD designer in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's got to do with 3D modeling and they prefer this type of software. Well, that doesn't really tell me anything. It just tells me they need a 3D model. So I say, you know, in my response, I say, well, please give me some details so I can help you out. Now, if they do give some details, I write a customized response to show them that I actually read what they said. For example, this guy came to me the other week, and he's, he had a part of his boat break. And he's like, I need a replacement part. So what I said was, hey, you know, if you mail me the part, I can measure it out, create the 3D model, and then 3D print you a replacement part. So I, I actually wrote that in my message because that shows, hey, listen, you know, I actually read what you have there. I'm not just some computer that's responding automatically. I'm an actual person. So that's been very helpful. And then the other tip I'd give is if they, they have the option of leaving their phone number, but if they leave it, I call right away. I mean, immediately. And so it actually, the one guy at today, I surprised him because I called him like, probably within five seconds of him putting it in. <laughs> Like literally, like wow. the second he hit enter, I was calling him on the phone because I want to get him on the phone right away. I want to establish that personal relationship, show him that I'm a real person here. I can help you out, you know, just get him to the front of his mind so that he doesn't spend a lot of time going to other people. And even, and to be honest, when I was doing my website, when I was get, trying to find someone for my website, a couple of people called me and the ones who called me, the ones I really remembered. And I just, he said, you know, the other people, I sent them a, a message. I didn't respond right away. I didn't want to wait forever to get started. So I just kind of picked one of those guys that had actually given me a call and taken some initiative. Yeah, if they're going to put in their phone number, you know that's probably a serious lead. And they're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we, you're, I assume you're still working full time at this point while some of these bid proposals are coming through. And right. you're like, you're trying to respond like, you know, underneath your, your desk at work or like. That's exactly what happened. I got caught. I mean, that's why I got, actually got let go. Because, well, it's, it was over time. I mean, I was actually pretty good about, I mean, I can't tell them, you know, it's, it's a catch 22. It's like, okay, yes, I should be straightforward with these people and tell them that I'm looking for a side job. But as soon as I tell them I'm doing something on the side, they're going to yeah. fire me and I haven't replaced my income yet. So it's like, how do I do it? So I had to just, and like I said, you can't wait till I get home at six o'clock in the evening to respond. All the, all of them are filled up. So yeah, that's what I was doing. I was on my phone and I, and I was you know under the table. And <laughs> so yeah, the notification goes off. Ah, sorry guys, I got to run to the bathroom again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I got to go today. What? Well, actually, back then the phone thing didn't work very good, so I actually had to use the work computer. So I think they actually caught me because they searched my internet history and found mm -hmm. something that come up. So okay. In any case, you know, I, I basically had to do it on the job because there really was no other option. It was like, okay, either you wait till six o'clock, you might have one job come in that late in the day, but you'll never build this up if you wait like that. You've got to, you got to do it when they come in. So it's kind of one of those things. So know? what, what was the income looking like at that point where they, <laughs> where they unceremoniously cut you loose? Was it like, okay, I can make this happen, or you're, I'm still stressed about? Um, it, it was probably like. 50% of what I was making per month of my full-time job. So I could make it work, but I'd have to cut back on my expenses a little bit, I think, or tap into my savings. But to be honest, I couldn't really ramp up my income on the side, on Thumbtack, on the side hustle, because I was so limited in my hours. So even though I would respond to people during the day, I couldn't really get to work until night. 
And so I was literally working 80 hours a week for like the last three months of that full-time job because I'd have to wait till I got home before I could fire up my, my own computer. I didn't have the software or the work computer that I couldn't install it even yeah. if I wanted to. So it was really, that was limiting my income on the side. And so I realized that, okay, even when they caught me and let me go, I was like, you know, I, th- I think in my mind, I believe that I can get to my full-time income that I was making because I'll have all this extra time available to do the actual work. And I won't have this big backlog and, and whatnot. And I, in fact, I wasn't even responding to as many jobs as I could have responded to because I didn't want to not be able to get the jobs done because of my limited hours available being that I had to be at that full-time right. job. So it was kind of like my plan originally was to work that job throughout the end of the year. They let me go in October. And then that just seemed like a good natural time to quit. Everyone always says, oh, the timing will never be right. So they kind of made the decision for me. I said, well, I might as well go all at it as hard as, as, hard as I can when they let me go and see how it works out. And I mean, it's worked out pretty well. I mean, most months have been equal, if not greater than what I was making in the past. And there's been a couple months that have been less and, and that's understandable. And, you know, I saved up a good amount from when I was working full time. And I've got some, I guess, some ideas and some, some plans in mind to kind of make, create more passive income. Cause what I'm doing now is really, I have to inv- be involved personally. I mean, I do have a couple of people that work for me to where I can feed them work if I have enough volume. So I, they, they can make me money while I'm making me money. Yes. But that's only if there's a lot there. And obviously, the margin is less. Like if I'm making 50 per hour myself and I'm paying someone else 30 per hour, well, then I'm only making 20 off of that guy. So my, some of my plans are, you know, I listened to one of your podcasts and they, and they talked about, what's it called, Udemy, where you create the yes. content online. And so that's one of my plans. In fact, I was looking into doing this and creating SolidWorks training videos because SolidWorks is the main program yeah. I use. And literally that week that I started, I listened to your podcast. I was like, that's a great idea, this teachable, this Udemy kind mm-hmm. of stuff. I'm going to you know, look into this. But I hadn't really done it yet. A girl from a website called Plural Site, which is like the same thing, they emailed me and said, we found your website. We need more SolidWorks CAD designers creating tutorials, making these videos. Do you want to do it? And so... You know, it took a little bit of time. I had to do an audition video, but I've already gone through all that. So right now, I'm actually starting to work on my very first SolidWorks tutorial video. So they'll actually pay you when you finish the video, and then they'll pay you royalties too. So that's kind of my one of my long term kind of things to kind of free up, not to be tied so much to my income in terms of time. Yeah, I was going to ask how how you plan on the kind of either productizing or scaling this thing. It's like you're kind of stuck in the same. You know, you got to go hustle for the work, and then you got to do the work, and you know, if you stop, if you take a month off, then you make nothing. The plural site thing is one thing. I think if I can get, you know, four or five videos out there, the royalty payments will be pretty decent. So that should help give me some buffer. And then I've also, you know, I myself an inventor. I, I love Shark Tank. It's one of my favorite shows. And so, and I see these products on there. I'm like, man, some of these, some of these things are so mm-hmm. simple. I can design it in CAD in five <laughs> minutes and make a prototype. My 3D printer four hours later, like that night and have it and have my prototype ready. I'm like, I should start working because I have ideas, obviously, myself of things I think that could be improved. And so it's like, that's kind of my next thing is I need to kind of free up more of my time to work on those because, you know, if I can create some simple little gadget to fix a problem, I know I can do all the engineering work myself. And then it's just a matter of doing the marketing and stuff and maybe even going on Shark Tank myself. That would be awesome if I could get on. And, you know, so that's kind of another thing to kind of productize, as you say, you know, Okay, so that's pluralsite.com for the video tutorials. I imagine you can repurpose that content to YouTube, to Udemy, to Skillshare, to wherever. Uh, okay, I think that's an interesting angle to go. I think these websites, though, requ- when I signed the, the paperwork, I think they, they said that you have to keep it. You can like you can use snippets of it, but you have to direct them to. It's kind of like you signed They want that. exclusivity. Yeah, okay. exactly. All right, fair enough. Interesting. Okay, and then go on the product creation route yourself. Hey, I've got this yeah, skill. I might as well put it to use. Um, and, and then go to the e-commerce route. I can see how I can sell this thing. Or what Stephen Key said a few episodes ago, I, I, maybe I can license this to somebody else. Hey, I already got a prototype. Yeah, exactly. I really, What I really want to do is just for my product ideas, I don't really, because I know what it takes to get something manufactured, the cost and the expense. Like an injection molding tool, perfect example. Like, like a water bottle, a tool, to, like, it could be $50,000 just for the investment of that. Like I would much rather have somebody else own 95% of the business and make that investment, at least at mm-hmm. the start, you know, it, rather than me tapping into my life savings to buy a tool that may produce a product that sells or may not. You know what I mean? You don't really know sometimes at the start how well it's going to do. So yeah, that, that one, that podcast that you gave or that you had with 
the licensing is exactly what I want to do. So I want to kind of you know draw up my idea in CAD, you know, 3D print it, de develop it, and then you know try to license it. That's kind of one of my uh, kind of like long term envisions. I like it. This is a it's a pretty cool business, Scott. Thank you for uh, for reaching out and sharing this stuff with us. Thumbtack is new to me. Plural site is new to me. Uh, lots of good stuff. So uh, you guys can check them out at caddesignhelp.com, C-A-D, designhelp.com. And uh, let's wrap this thing up uh, with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. You really have to get started. You know, going back to where I, I can't believe where I am today, to be honest with you. I mean, the freedom I have, being able to do what I want pretty much every day, controlling my schedule. It all started with just taking that action. It, you know, I, like I said, I started the website a whole year before I even got my first client. And I had to go in person to get my first client. And so it's, you really have to put in some effort. But when you start building that momentum, it's incredible, like the feeling you get when you, you just start getting clients, you start getting work, and you realize that, hey, this, I can actually make this happen. Like I really didn't think I could make it happen, but I just kept at it. But, you really ha but the whole first thing is, you know, it's cliche, but you just have to take action and get started. If you've got a skill set, you know you can sell. If you just get started, you can do it. Appreciate it, Scott. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Awesome, thank you. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is brought to you by DesignCrowd.com. When you need design work done in your business for a logo, a book cover, a new website, check out Design Crowd. This is a cool service because it lets you tap into the creative energy of thousands and thousands of designers instead of trying to do it all yourself or hiring just one freelancer. Now, I've got a new book project I'm working on this summer. I'm really excited to give Design Crowd a shot for the cover design. And of course, we'll keep you guys posted along the way and have you vote on your favorites. So how it works is you enter in a description of the design you need and what it's going to be used for. Then it's open for submission to Design Crowd's community of half a million designers. A typical project receives dozens of different designs from designers all around the world. They're all competing for your business, like a contest. And when the contest ends, usually after a week or 10 days, you get to pick your favorite and the winner gets paid. If you don't find a design you like, you're protected by Design Crowd's money-back guarantee. And there's more good news. They've got a special deal for Side Hustle Show listeners. If you check out designcrowd.com slash hustle, you can get up to $100 off your next design project. That's designcrowd.com slash hustle, or simply enter the discount code hustle when posting a project on Design Crowd. Okay, I got to make a disclaimer real quick. So I want you to be very careful about side hustling on company time. Like I'm, I'm happy that Scott landed on his feet and I know he was going to take the leap eventually, but I still want you to leave on good terms. If there's a way for you to juggle your business and your job during business hours, great. If not, that, that part made me really nervous. So I'd, I'd rather have you ramp up slower then get kicked to the curb before you're ready. But maybe that's just my risk averse, cautious uh, self. So I uh, just, just want to put that out there. Uh, so my takeaways for this episode, number one is uh, the piggyback principle, which is essentially finding a gold rush to sell shovels in. I think the, and I'll link up a, a whole essay on that uh, in the show notes. So I think the maker movement is one of those gold rushes. And if 3D printing democratizes manufacturing like a lot of people think it's going to there's there's gonna be a lot more grassroots demand for product design services like scott's i think we're already starting to see that number two was to get in front of your target customers in their natural habitat and i know this is marketing 101 but i think it's something that scott did really well both in person at the local inventors group meetings and online at thumbtack.com number three was thinking about ways to scale especially as a freelancer so scott mentioned um, already a handful of ways for his business to grow and, and some of those he's already acting on. Number one was hiring subcontractors, essentially building a CAD design agency. I know it, it you know, it's so, so it cuts into your margins and you've got to worry about quality control as you step in kind of like in that managerial role or general contractor role. But it's, it's just a natural step in removing himself from, from doing the hands-on labor. The second thing was teaching CAD design online. I think that's a big opportunity there. Um, do, even as part of that maker movement. And, and we've even seen side, other side hustle show guests follow a similar path. Most recently that comes to mind was Gina Horky with her freelance writing business in episode 164. And the third thing was building authority to pull clients in instead of having to reactively bid for work all the time. Now, Scott's already got a great domain, caddesignhelp.com, and he told me offline he's already starting to see some traffic and requests come in organically through that site, and I think that's only going to grow as the domain ages, as he adds more helpful content. Uh, so I think uh, a cool cool thing he's got going there. 
So notes and links for this one are at sidehustlenation.com slash Scott, S-C-O-T-T. And while you're there, be sure to download the free PDF highlight reel with all his top tips from our conversation. And that's it for me. I'm off next week uh, to Chicago for the annual podcast movement conference, which honestly has become something of a family reunion for me. I'm really looking forward to hanging out with, with all my internet friends and my wife calls them next week. It's, a, it's just a ton of fun. The, the Side Hustle Show is also up for Best Business Podcast uh, at the Academy of Podcasters Awards at the conference. Lots of stiff competition in that category, so please wish me luck. And I just want to say thank you for spending part of your week with me and your earbuds. I know there are a ton of podcasts out there and only 24 hours in the day, so it really it really means a lot that you choose to spend some time, even virtually, um, hanging out with, with me and my guests. So until next time, Let's go out there and make something happen, and I'll see you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to The Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 